we were so impressed that an indian american has been to this teacher you know very few people have made it to the nobel prize you know tell me what did you do out of the odd how did you get there you know people I, can't even imagine <laughs> i was very lucky i mean it's it's a wonderful to get this prize but it's particularly wonderful i think because it's a prize not i think for us but also for the entire movement i think that this is a movement that we happen to be at the beginning of i think mostly luck and um, it, but it's grown to be a worldwide movement there are about 400 professors who are in one form or the other associated with jpl's work and they all do uh, randomized control trials three of us worked on the same set of issues which are how to do uh, rigorous evaluations of anti poverty programs you have introduced a way of conducting research that helps us better to understand the root causes of poverty as well as to find effective ways of alleviating it the experimental approach you pioneered has transformed research in development economics the research that follows this approach has already influenced policy and it keeps improving our ability to help those in most need. You can set up a sequence of experiments in the same location to build up the th theories. You can see if the same people treated in different ways give you different outcomes. Just do what do what you love and love what you do. I think that's that's advice for life and it's really almost the only advice I have. For everyone we are very lucky to be joined by abhijit banerji the nobel laureate for economics uh, and uh, he has come all the way from east coast to west coast how's the experience at sala you know it's uh, i'm jealous this kind of perfect day <laughs> wonderful talks i mean it, it, it's uh, you guys are lucky to the, the, the weather you are always lucky but sala is wonderful event i'm lucky to be here until trump decides that he wants to climb down the indian government can't really afford politically to climb down so in that sense i think the, to me the question is more uh, what do you do if you are in that situation and i would say uh, well, the we, there is a very large literature showing that if you don't allow a uh, smooth transition out of trade shocks you get long term costs so what we should be doing is we had all this money that we didn't manage to spend on make in india we should now really spend it on protecting the industries that have been hit letting them uh, giving them a, a sort of a landing path that works for them you know we were so impressed that an indian american has been to this teacher you know very few people have made it to the nobel prize you know tell me what did you do out of the odd how did you get there you know people can't even imagine <laughs> i was very lucky uh, you know being at the right place at the right time always works i think it's still going to be wonderful for the movement that this prize was given because i think it's going to make it a little easier to penetrate the many doors that you know are half open to us or not quite open to us and hopefully bring the message of of uh policy based on evidence and hard thinking to the to many other places as well and what is that one formula if you may share that you have to alleviate poverty that there is no one formula and um, in us versus in india what are the key factors that contribute to poverty that you think uh, have a lot of variables what are those variables as well if you can say in the us poverty is something that seems fully tragic because there is no reason in such a rich country in india there is real resource constraints so you can't imagine you can you can't imagine 
just pouring resources into the US is just being cheap. To be honest, uh, I think the, the, uh, the sense from our research has been that actually some ways the same insights go for poor people in many places. Maybe not in Sweden where maybe it's just very different to be poor because of the social welfare networks much better. But I, having worked in Indonesia, in Ghana, in uh, Kenya, in India, which are very different places, I would say the similarities are more st striking than the differences. I think people are, I think both creative and, and often sort of people I think the idea that the poor are sort of, sort of fixed machines which have no choice is all wrong. People are both, I mean, poor people have, enjoy their lives, they look for opportunities, they try things, they are also scared by them, they, are, they make mistakes. All, all of the things that we do, they do. So in that sense, I don't think that one needs a different uh, sense of uh, psychology to study the poor. The poor, I think that in fact I would say what we often miss with the poor is precisely the opposite which is that they have the same psychology as us. We often underestimate how important that is which is that we think the poor, well you know they're starving so they must only want to eat nutritious food. But in fact they don't because they also want to have fun so if they might sacrifice some nutritious food to eat something that's tasty. And I think that that's the psychology that we have as well. We were not going to just stay on a diet eating, you know, whatever, uh, quinoa every day. We're going to have something delicious sometimes. And I think that in that sense, I don't think the psychology is deeply different. And I don't think it's deeply different across the world either. Tell me a little more about your association with Esther and the other uh, gentlemen, uh, because you guys shared the Nobel, P Nobel Prize. So the three of us works on the same set of issues which are how to do uh, rigorous evaluations of anti-poverty programs. Randomized control trials and the idea of them is to be to look at interventions through the comparison of random treatment and control groups. People who are randomly chosen to get an intervention and people who are randomly chosen not to get an intervention to compare them to know whether that in what impact that intervention had. People are going to be either sort of just too poor to make it and then they'll become poorer and poorer and you see the hump on the left or you, they'll become richer and richer and then you see the hump on the left. The middle will empty out and that's what this picture shows. This is the distribution of productive assets. So you do see exactly the pattern you might have expected. Why is this important? First, because it offers a possibility of a big bang. A small intervention could have big effects on the lives of people. That of course is fundamental in a sense. Uh, that's fundamental uh, and of course it means that your social return on investment, the fact that if I give people money that has big consequences in people's lives, is that's very good news because you could give a little bit and get a lot for it. But I'll also, I mean, what idea is bigger than the idea that poor, the poorest of the poor have enough talent to be self-sufficient? That if you give them a push, they'll stay up. What idea is bigger than that? In a sense, I, I mean, in the realm of big ideas, this is an enormous idea because it gives us faith in humanity. What, what, what could be bigger than that? And the reason why we did an RCT to do this is because we needed to follow people carefully over time to understand what's going on. We needed, and to do that, we would need to know who were the people who got the asset and people who were, went. The fact that an RCT gives you a lot of specificity, you can identify the people who should have got it and the people who didn't, and you can follow them over time, means that you can collect data to demonstrate something like this. Without an RCT, it would be much harder to demonstrate. Maybe you could do it, but it would be much harder to demonstrate that there was some dynamic pattern like this. The RCTs give you a very unique kind of data because you know who exactly to follow. This is Jasleen from Your India TV and it's an absolute honor to see you at SalaFest 2025. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, you gave some experimental approach to uh, alleviate poverty worldwide. How has it evolved 
from the time when you received the Nobel Peace Prize till date, you know, in 2025, 2019 through 2025, since the uh, economic movement and everything, the dynamics have changed a lot. And second part of the question, uh, you know, Dems have their own approach to alleviate poverty by focusing on taxation. However, reps have a different approach. I don't know what is right and wrong, but as an economist, what's your take on improving USA and really uh, be able to make it great again? On, on, on the question of, um, I think that one thing that happened which was very salient is, I think during the pandemic, a lot of countries figured out a way to deliver money to uh, welfare payments using a whole set of online infrastructures. And this happened not just in India, but also in Togo, or also in country, poor countries in Africa. <coughs> I think this has changed the, the discourse, which is much easier and much more reliable, these channels. So I think that's one big change that's happened. So I think they are a consequence of us not taking the consequences of globalization seriously. I think globalization was hurting. Our, as economists, our presumption is that that hurt is temporary and it goes away quickly because people react to the, that by moving and changing jobs and retraining. We know now that those processes are slow and as a result, people actually get quite badly hurt. So I, I think it is a sense in which I would say it's not so much that, um, I don't know whether this means capitalism went right or wrong. It does mean that I think the way the policy responds to the pain caused by globalization was inadequate, often even in the wrong direction. If you, one of the numbers that just came out is the, uh, the National Sample Survey, which comes out every one and a half years or so, and it's a, 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 it gives you the average consumption in urban and rural areas in India. And the fact that we see in that is that between 2014, 15 and 2017, 18, that number has slightly gone down. And that's the first time such a thing has happened in many, 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 many years. So that's a that's a very so glaring warning sign. I. There's enormous fight going on in India about which data is right, and the government has a particular view of all data that's inconvenient to it is wrong. But nonetheless, I think that this is this is this is something that uh, I think even the government is increasingly recognizing that there is a problem. I don't know exactly what to do. The government has a large deficit, but right now it's sort of at least aiming to please everybody by pretending to hold to some budgetary targets and monetary targets. And my view is that this is the economy going into a tailspin is the time when you don't worry so much about monetary stability and you worry a little bit more about demand. I think demand is a huge problem right now in the economy. <laughs>